Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to call to order the April 6, 2017 meeting of the City of Valley and Planning Commission. Um, I'd like to ask everyone to silence electronic devices at this time. So uh, laptops, if you're taking notes or uh, you've got your cell phone, please put it on silent. Um, Heather, will you please call the roll? Holly Taishi? Here. Garrett O'Brien? Here. Dave Crooks? Here. Lisa Anderson? Here. Phyllis McKee? Here. Mike Estes? Here. Iris Mata Gibson? Here. All right, thank you. So uh, at this point, we would approve previous meeting's minutes, but we don't have any minutes to approve, so we'll, we'll move um, through that item and uh, move right into a public comment period. And with the Planning Commission, we have a public comment period at every meeting. Uh, this is an opportunity for people to speak about something that's not on our agenda tonight. Our agenda tonight, there's just one item, which is the continuation of our work session on the subdivision ordinance update. So this would be an opportunity to speak about anything else. If you're here to speak about the subdivision ordinance update, you need to wait. We will give you an opportunity to speak um, at the end of our work session. But uh, if anybody here wants to talk about anything else, it's completely wide open. You can come up to the mic and you get three minutes to speak about any topic of your choosing. Uh, is there anybody who would like to speak? Okay, so seeing no one, we will close the public comment period. And uh, we're gonna move right into our work session. Um, actually, you know what, before we do that, um, I think we should do introductions. So we have two new planning commissioners uh, starting tonight, it's their first meeting. Both uh, Mike and Iris are uh, newly appointed um, by our mayor. And um, I would like to give you each the opportunity to maybe just briefly introduce yourself um, and talk about um, like who you are and what maybe uh, drew you to being a member of the Planning Commission. Mike, you wanna start with you? Sure. Sure, uh, Mike Estes, I live downtown, I work downtown, and um, uh, my day job is in software development, uh, so I deal with lots of complicated issues in the virtual world. Um, so my interest in the Planning Commission is uh, helping to shape our community grow and adapt to um, how popular of a place this has become. And uh, I'd like to put my talents to use dealing with complicated issues in the physical world. Great, thank you. Iris? Wonderful evening, everyone. My name is Iris Mowdy Gibson. I've lived in Bellingham for um, just over 20 years. Grew up here, attended Bellingham Public Schools. I've lived in um, almost, I think, nine neighborhoods um, over the years in Bellingham, everywhere from North Bellingham to South to East and West. And, um, I've had an opportunity to learn about the varying needs of people who move to our community and who've lived here all their lives and for many generations. And so uh, I'm excited to bring that background along with um, my skills in public policy and in public processes. My day job is with the Whatcom Dispute Resolution Center and so um, an organization that deals with complex issues and in, in conflicts uh, interfamily and in community and so I look forward um, to helping uh, the interests and underlying needs of community members um, be brought to the surface and heard um, at this level. Great, thank you. And I know we, uh, as a commissioner, are excited to have you both. Um, and I know that the staff is as well. And it's always good to have new people and new perspectives participate. <coughs> so, welcome. Um, and we're gonna throw you right in the mix, right in the middle of our, our work session on subdivision ordinance. So, um, for Anyone watching or those of you in the audience, um, we this is a, our third work session. Is that right, Kathy? Third? Yeah, third work session on this topic. So we're right in the middle of discussion, discussing the subdivision ordinance update. And um, this is not a public hearing. It's not uh, a presentation of a final document. This is just an opportunity for us to work with staff collaboratively, which is why we're in this uh, floor set up as opposed to up in our chairs, so that we can just kind of talk about uh, the draft document that's been presented so far, and and we're working our way through the chapters incrementally. So we're not gonna be talking about the whole ordinance tonight. We're just gonna be kind of picking up where we left off, which was about halfway through, and working through as much as we can. And we're gonna start with a presentation from Kathy. We will have a public hearing at some point in the future on this ordinance after uh, we've gone through these work sessions and staff has developed a, a working ordinance document so for presentation. So with that, Kathy, take us away. Yeah. Thank you. Um, assuming many of you are 
in the audience are students. Um, this will be a very lively um, presentation. And uh, I'm kidding, actually. It's, uh, we are going through the subdivision ordinance and our first intent is to go through all procedural aspects of the code to help um, planning commissioners and those interested in this particular topic um, to gain a, a much broader understanding of really what subdivisions are because they are, very, uh, they are a very technical aspect of what we do for city planning. Um, they sometimes go beyond um, really what you see when you drive through neighborhoods. It all starts with subdivisions and it ends with the builders and the design. So there's a lot that goes into it. This is part of the very beginning of uh, what we go through. So we started in January 12th and we started at the beginning and we all generally agreed, um, the planning commission and staff, um, the, the process of how we would go through this. And as Ali stated, it's pretty much chapter by chapter, but we're leaving some chapters out um, until we get through all the procedural aspects. And the primary reason for that is process is the relatively easy part of the code. It's when we get into the actual development standards, that's, that's really where there's going to need to be a lot of conversation and a lot of understanding. And, and hopefully going through these chapters is, is creating that foundation or that basis to, to be able to understand when we start talking about lot width and we start talking about street frontage, we'll, we'll begin to understand how that fits into the process. And just to jump into that would be way overwhelming. So we have a few more chapters to go through. Um, we've gone through general provisions. We've done lot line adjustments, short plats, preliminary plats, and final plats, and that's where we ended last um, work session. The goal today or this evening will be to get through the next four chapters, which actually brings us to the conclusion of the subdivision ordinance. Um, but it would be the binding site plans, the plat alterations and plat vacations, and variance administrative departures and penalty. And I can just say right now the penalty is word for word what's out of our existing code and it's working great, but we'll get through that really quickly when it's there. So there are not a lot of significant changes. So what I want to go through first and I apologize, that one's not working. So Phyllis, you're gonna need to figure out which way is gonna be more comfortable for you. So sorry, and Mike, you as well. So binding site plans. Um, this is the only section of the subdivision ordinance that we are proposing a complete new process. Um, the others have been a hybrid and hopefully making that process better. This is a brand new process. I don't know that it's necessarily important to understand what the new or what the existing process is as much as to go into what the proposed uh, process is. I can share with you that the binding site pl plan process is not used a lot. Um, it is used heavily in Whatcom County and a lot of the lands that we have annexed included binding site plans but a lot of the development of the property that is within the city of Bellingham, the binding site plans for whatever reason have not been that preferred method of subdivision. So we're hoping to change that and to provide um, a different opportunity and a different process that potentially will entice people because we believe that there's value um, in the binding site plan process. So what you see up in the PowerPoint right now is there, there are a few provisions that we're adding and one is the allowance for the residential uses. State law actually states a binding site plan process is an alternative method of land division, which is really interesting um, because what that says is that it's not a subdivision, it's a binding site plan. Well, what is the difference? The difference is, is the code, um, the state law restricts it to commercial industrial lands for sale and lease so you can actually create parcels that are specifically for lease. They don't have to be for sale. Where you go, again, what's the difference? Because residential, you can create a parcel and rent it. And why is a rent different than a lease if you're talking about commercial industrial? And the state also gives the opportunity, which the current regulations don't right now, is to allow residential uses. And residential uses are only allowed if compliant through the condominium process 
or in compliance with the condominium rules and regulations under state law. So the new regulations are proposing to implement residential uses, which would then require them to also comply with the condominium rules and regulations. We're also imposing decision criteria, which currently right now, similar to um, the short plats and the preliminary plats and final plats, there, there is no decision criteria currently, and we believe that there is a lot of merit and value in having decision criteria in all the decisions we make. Uh, we are modifying the site or the review process, which would include a site plan approval. Then you go into the next step of infrastructure, and then you go into a final plat approval. And similarly to what we are, what we've recommended in uh, short plats and preliminary plats as well as a modification process. So those are our highlights. What I want, before we go through the chapter, what I at least want to do is take the opportunity to show some binding site plans because they're actually, they're, they're fairly unique. And all of these that I am going to show you with the exception of one started in Whatcom County. And as I said, they were annexed to the city, but there is one in here that um, we did in the city. So the first one I'm going to show you is what we did in the city. And the first is what a general binding site plan looks like. And I'm not going to flip through a lot so we don't have to go through this transition every single time. So what you see here is just a lot of lines and a lot of buildings and just a lot of information. But the only thing that's really pertinent on this is that this shows a boundary of a parcel. That's a general binding site plan. It really is nothing more than the survey of a parcel. What goes with the binding site plan, however, are all of the development requirements in order to do a use, commercial and industrial, on that piece of property. Where you go from this, once you establish the general binding site plan, is you come in what we call a specific binding site plan. That's not really focusing very well, is it? So what the specific binding site plan is, you can see it starts to take shape where now we have lots that start to look more like a subdivision. That's the alternative subdivision. So I still haven't answered the question, what's the difference? Somebody could subdivide this property. They could go through a preliminary plat process similar to what a residential is. But what the binding site plan process affords is to have private infrastructure, everything to be maintained and owned privately, and to not be required to have the streets that we require in residential subdivisions. So they can have narrow roads. They don't necessarily have to have um, infrastructure or uh, public walkways in every location like we do have sidewalks with subdivisions. So we look at industrial lands differently through binding site plan than we do as if it were subdivided. So it's providing some flexibility. It's an alternative. And it is not necessarily required that they create fee simple lots because they can also create through a condominium process airspace lots. So they're selling spaces rather than fee simple lots. The difference is subtle when you look at it, but it's not subtle in how you look at how the property is actually governed through ownership and through maintenance um, responsibilities and obligations. So another one I want to show you just real quick from an industrial perspective. Both of these happen to be up in the Iron Gate industrial area. So here is one again that you can see the outline of the parcel. It's a relatively small parcel. Midway Lane is a private road that comes in to serve this property. They then came in and did their first binding site plan, specific binding site plan. And what you can see here is they only created one lot. But you can see the shape of a cul-de-sac. And all the rest is what we call a reserve track. That means it's reserved for future use, but it's not immediately creating a parcel right now. So what I'm going to show you is now not as nice of a parcel or a picture because I hand drew it. 
But this is what it looks like at the end of the day. So my numbering is the number of specific binding site plans that they did. So in number one that we saw, they created one parcel in a stormwater tract. Specific binding site plan number two created one more. Three actually created two lots, and they just kept going. And there's still one more that's in reserve that potentially they could further subdivide into two or however many. Because when we get into commercial and industrial, we're not concerned about densities like we are with residential. The densities are what form, for the most part, our residential lot sizes and the shapes and, and um, basically just the character of our neighborhoods. But we're not typically concerned, if ever, with that with commercial and industrial lands. So I just kind of wanted to show you that the general binding site plan in our current process is really it's a survey of land. It's the specifics that actually start creating the parcels. Now, from a residential perspective, this one is actually pretty interesting. And I will not give you the background of this because we do not have enough time. This is just west of the uh, Wa uh, Whatcom Community College, which is over in this general area. And the important thing to note here, besides there's a lot of wetlands, which are all these dotted little tracks, is that we have these development pads, if you will, we call them reserve tracks, and there are effectively two, one north and one south. That's a general binding site plan. It's a survey of the property, the rights of way, and what's there. And then what, we, what the um, property owner did is they then went into the specific process. And here's your first specific binding site plan, and I'll show you where that is in relation to what we're looking at. So they start off with their specific binding site plan creating this parcel. And then we start to get more detailed into the same application. I'm trying to do it the same orientation where this is the road and this is the parcel that was south. And now you can start to see this is the specific lot, but then they start to form individual unit lots. They call them airspace condo lots. And then as a part of their condominium, what they do is they start to do this, and it really starts to look like a subdivision. But it's not a subdivision, it's a condominium. And so there is an association that is required to be formed that will own and maintain all the private infrastructure within this proposal. If it were a single family preliminary plat, this would be a public, these would be public roads, all the infrastructure would be public, everything would be public. So it affords some flexibility, some opportunities for the developers if they want to build less, it gives them the opportunity to do that, but then there's, there's also the other side of that is now the homeowners are doing the ownership and the maintenance of what are ca typically called common elements. This is what we don't have in the city in our current binding site plan process. The only reason we have this is because this was annexed into the city of Bellingham and they had that opportunity. We think there's value in this. That's why we're recommending and proposing um, to do that. And as we carry on, and then I will end my little spiel. Again, still everything south of the road. Here was track one, and then they come in with a specific. Now they're going to create track two and know that they've created the condominium on top of that as well, and you start to see the individual airspace lots. So with that, that is my brief introduction of the binding site plan process, and I will sit down now, and if we have any questions or want to talk about any of the specific provisions, we can certainly go through as we've um, done with the others. I, I will... I will openly admit that our new process or the process that we're proposing is not entirely new in that um, it is a 
It is a framework that is used in Port Townsend, which is where currently the director, Rick Seppler, um, where he formerly was, and it was a very effective tool um, that worked in Port Townsend a lot for their industrial and, and commercial lands as well. And when we reviewed it, we felt that it could also carry over and be very applicable to the residential. Um, it's subtly different, but we're hoping it's subtly different enough to where um, we can start to get people enticed to use the application and to just provide another alternative, hence the name alternative subdivision, but just another way of doing business. Thank you, Kathy. Let's just open it up to discussion and questions. Do any planning commissioners have any initial questions or comments for staff? Lisa? I would just like to make sure that I have an understanding as far as how condominium is being used. Um, the example that you had shown, um, the development, those um, are basically uh, independently standing buildings. Usually I think of a condominium being uh, residential areas that are adjoining or stacked. So would this be a situation where condominium is being utilized in terms of that the land is kind of commonly owned through an association and so the individuals would own perhaps the building but not the land it sits on and they pay dues for the maintenance? Is that how that situation, if there was applied? This particular one is not that. They've actually created in their, um, in their airspace uh, units, their yards, if you will, and their driveways. Um, there are condominiums that do that, where they will define the building as a um, common element, and then within the building, each unit becomes its, um, the ownership opportunity and then everything around it is owned in whole by the association. And um, it is truly a work of art for those attorneys who do condominiums. And our review of those documents is to ensure, when our legal reviews is, is to ensure that they're compliant with state law. And also if there are any specific conditions that, are, that need to be met or carried out through um, perpetuity then we make sure that those are in there. And the thing that's nice about a condominium association as opposed to a homeowners association is their ability to lean and their ability to have leverage and to actually collect and assess dues. Where homeowners associations, um, by the nature of the state, can be very limited in their ability to do that. So their enforcement can often be lacking where the condominium association um, provides a much better enforcement opportunity, which gives a lot more validity to the type of development under a binding site plan, should someone choose to do that through the binding site plan process. So in these situations, they're not necessarily held to the same um, kind of, I don't want to say design standards, but lot size and stuff that you would find in a single family neighborhood. So there would be a little bit more flexibility in this type of situation to implement the infill toolkit and such as far as smaller cottage housing and would that be able to be utilized in this type of situation? Yeah, I mean because where you could do a binding site plan for residential, you would be able to do um, the similar to what we're proposing where you can do infill toolkit under clusters as well. There will already be a lot of aspects to the infill toolkit that will um, carry over into common elements because they many of them require private lanes or private alleys, so there will already be that mechanism, and there's already so much flexibility that they may not opt to do the binding site plan. Um, I think it, it, it maybe in some situations it would be a wash from that perspective. I think one thing that I would add to that is that if they're being used in a residentially zoned area, they would still have to meet the density requirements and such of, of that area. Yes. So is it offering more flexibility with a lot of these examples for wetlands, sort of critical areas, more uh, tools to work around critical areas regulations? Yes. Yep. So are, when you say infrastructure being private, sewer water, or is the city water and sewer? 
Um, Public Works is still working on that component. Right now, at least under commercial and industrial, your access can be private, but they still, um, the provisions still require abutment on a public sewer in Maine. And the question that has been raised is why? Yeah. Um, it, because it doesn't necessarily have to be, and that's just more maintenance um, that the public is required to maintain if it can be done in a different manner. So those are, um, when, when we talk Title 13 and, and other provisions, those are things that we're definitely entering into that discussion. What about road, like road standards for fire safety and? Fire is what will typically drive your road standard in commercial industrial. And obviously when we get into residential, we're gonna wanna see the pedestrian facilities because those are, they're definitely very important. And in some commercial and industrial areas, they may be as equally as important too. So having the ability to have that determination as to when they're necessary or not, maybe in commercial industrial, one side is sufficient. Maybe in residential, it'll be two sides. I mean, it's, it, it gives, we're, we're anticipating that the public work standards are going to anticipate opportunities for in some criteria as to when to make those decisions. <laughs> So like, yeah, because a lot of so a lot of the standards are going to be uh, addressed in other chapters. A lot of them, other, yes. Yeah, because yes. this seems. This is process. Yeah. Yes. Pretty much just yes. process. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Kathy, what about uh, taxing these lots within the uh, binding site plan? Are are they treated the same as a single family, resident? lot outside of these binding site plans? You know, I honestly don't know. I haven't looked at the um, tax assessment. For example, the one I showed you on West Cordata Green. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Seems to me like we're talking ben benefits to the city for this type of uh, site uh, binding site plans. I have to think that there's some kind of advantage here to the city other than providing utilities. But I don't think the city would would not take advantage of a regular type of property taxes. I I think the opera it, when you're when you're when you're um, when you're working with residential, it's it, it allows less infrastructure but the burden is passed to the owners. So it allows the developers to create potentially better neighborhoods, better design, because they have some flexibility in unique situations. Um, but there's a burden that comes with that, and that burden is realized by the developers, and in part that's their choice whether to do it or not and whether it makes sense. Clearly, the more units you have, the more you can spread that burden, and the burden is reduced. Um, binding site plan for a few lots, maybe it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense because you might just use your typical subdivision or infill toolkit or something like that. Um, we just we just haven't seen a lot of them. In industrial and commercial, you can drive out the Iron Gate and you know it's working all day long. And it, the whole thing in dust out in Iron Gate, both north and south of Baker View, is a, just a lot of binding site plans. And so we know it's working in industrial. Um, we have not done many within the city. The Port of Bellingham and the waterfront has the opportunity to do binding site plans and as development happens. Um, we have some binding site plans on, um, uh, where else do we? I mean, there just, there aren't too many. And we're trying to entice and trying to figure out a way of making it a functional, at least a good alternative for people to use. Mike? Uh, what's the different scale of, of road, private roads you could see? You mentioned like private alleys, but if you're getting into like sidewalks on both sides and you know, could it be a thro like a through street? And what, I'm, I'm just wondering about you know, 30 years on when, when maintenance is required and that's not gonna be on the city, that's on the private organization. Um, is there any, maybe this is a design standard, is there any hint to the public that like, oh, that road is not some crumbling city road that's private? Like, do you go up like a sidewalk? So it's kind of, oh yeah, that's a private lane, I understand that. But if it's more of a through road, just kind of visually understanding why the road condition might be in a different shape than you'd expect from the city? So for example, if we take the, the binding site plan that I gave you, the road that bisects the parcel from the north and the south is June Road and that's a public right of way. 
So you have your full width arterial standard, curb gutter sidewalks, both sides, and two travel lanes with turn lanes as necessary intersections. When you go off of that road into the development, then those are private. And typically, as stated um, previously, is the fire department that is gonna dictate what the width of those roads need to be, what the turnaround requirements are, whether it's commercial, industrial, or residential. And what we will need to distinguish and to bring forward for um, consideration is when pedestrian facilities are necessary. I know that there's <laughs> some road standards for commercial and industrial require sidewalks when there are some road standards for residential that don't. So we really need to bring these into consistency so that we can you know, have a uniform approach for when we're doing roads. Um, there could also be a sign, a sign um, you know, uh, I know like this, the, the county used to use different colored signs for private road versus not. Sometimes there's a PVT at the end of it saying it's private. We don't have a lot of experience with private roads in the city. And a lot of that reason why is because we haven't had the mechanism or the ability through a condominium association to actually leverage enforcement. Homeowners associations don't get us that. So the minute there's a pothole, the first person they call is the city. And it's, so we have shied away from them because we don't have that mechanism. And the condominium association um, and other aspects in multifamily where they have to go and repair their driveways and to do all that, they don't, they don't call the city because they know they're private. But you typically have one owner too, so it's a little different. Uh, yes, I just had a question about uh, who drafts language for the association for maintenance and, and repairs and all of that. I mean, you're starting out, everything's new, everything looks good. 10, 15 years down the line, is there a mechanism that's part of this kind of a development that would mandate any, have any kind of power? I know you can, it talks about uh, leaning and so on, but that means there needs, still needs to be a body of, that's, you know, has power. There is, and that's okay. the condominium association. Okay. Um, the the condo declarations are um, they're they're a very intricate um, document that has a lot of definitions and a lot of obligations and not only current obligations but ongoing and they right. define what are common elements and what are limited common elements and they really go in to define those spaces that are more public or more owned in common and they start to get limited, that is only to a few, and then they start to define specifically what each entity can own and what their obligations are. So those, those are defined well enough so if somebody should find themselves in the minority rather than the majority, as you couldn't have the majority of people decide I'm not gonna you know, pay into that repair. I mean, is that, or, or could they? The condominium rules and regulations, I understand, are mandated by state law, oh. and they are very prescribed in state law what they at least shall include at a minimum, and my understanding is in talking with um, many of the attorneys who have prepared <laughs> them is that they typically go above and beyond because they have an interest for that person, first person in, the developers want to say the last person is going to have the same obligations that you have and that it's gonna look just as good then as it does now. So it's, it's an ability to try to you know, maintain that. I mean, those standards are described when somebody first buys in, not everybody gets together over coffee and decides how they're gonna be. 100%. Yeah. They are okay. recorded before they can sell any of the units. Got it, yes. thank you. Lisa, Iris. So as far as on the residential end, um, you had a, a group of, uh, I don't want to say just developers, but you had a group of um, individuals who kind of gave you ideas. So from the development community side, is this something that they're saying is wanted? If you're looking for enticement of um, looking how to best develop, is this something that um, various stakeholders in the development community said would be beneficial? To have residential, yes. Harris? Oh, was it? Oh. We, a lot of our discussion so far has been about the residential component of a binding site plan. And in my experience, like 
the vast majority of mining site plans are for industrial commercial development, like business parks, mm -hmm. you know, we, like you mentioned, Iron Gate, Barclay, and Cordata are like the three areas where we have these things. And the process by which the county and I think the city previous to this, you have, like you said, you have your general and you say, this is my 40 acres, say, or my 20 acres, and I'm drawing a line around it and I'm gonna maybe say the main road's gonna go through right here, right? And then you break off a specific parcel for a specific tenant or a specific buyer. And, and in my experience with the development community, the, the, the great like incentive to doing that in an industrial or commercial context is that you have flexibility to the market. You only have to provide, like Bob comes along and says, I want two acres for my auto body shop and you do a specific binding site plan and create a two acre parcel. And then two years later, Joe comes along and says, I want 10 acres to build a manufacturing plant and you break off 10 acres for him. And I, this is very different. This, what you've written is very much consistent with the plat sections. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that flexibility built in here. And there I'm wondering how, like if I'm the guy with 20 acres and I wanna lock out my full 20 with the main roads, but I wanna break off individual parcels as I go to respond to that market, how do I do that within this document? Is that, and maybe I'm just not reading it correctly, but. It's definitely not as evident and apparent, and that is the main distinction between them um, of the two. This actually takes the approach more of our plan development process. And our plan development process is we have areas within the city that are designated planned. And part of the, the, the plan designation when someone applies for an application is to approve a site plan. This includes that process of the site plan. And then once you have that site plan approved and formulated, you then go into what we would now call the specific mining site plan process and start to build your infrastructure and to do your lots because this allows you to do a phased binding site plan. So that would happen through a phasing plan effectively? Yes, yes. And when you say a site plan approval, do you mean like the details of those lots? Is yes. You, so I think this actually restricts flexibility pretty significantly because I can't come in and just carve off two acres for the guy who needs two acres and I can't carve off four acres a year later for the guy who needs four acres, correct? Like I would have to have all my lots planned out in advance. At least consistent with the preliminary approval, but then you can, you can still create lots through specifics as you go through and create your infrastructure as you go through. So, okay, so you could, so that, I'm not seeing where that is. Like where, where is the specific, like where in this process do we go from the overall site plan to I wanna carve off one parcel now? Because it says... And maybe I'm just not reading it clearly. Because you've got your procedure and you do your, you do your, um, where is it? It talks your review and preliminary approval, right? So you yeah. go through your review and you get your preliminary approval. It and then talks you do your final the, binding site plan. It talks about the phase development. Yeah, and there's a comment this. in here about phasing. Um, I guess I just want to express concern because when I read this, mm -hmm. it looks like it makes a lot of sense for like the residential context but the vast majority of people who use this is not in a residential context. And I like that we're trying to open up the opportunity for the residential context, but I would hate to see that flexibility for an industrial or commercial user be removed because that's the whole point. You know, you do a business park, you don't know who's coming in and you need to have that flexibility to respond to that tenant. And I don't see like that phase, I don't see that in here. I don't see where, where you get to, you know, do, do this bit mm -hmm. by bit. So the opportunity with that then that um, you, that the commission can provide direction to staff is to consider and review a hybrid. Because if we know when it does, when it is used for commercial industrial, it's working well. It is, yeah, it is. Okay, then, then maybe that's not the component that we change. And maybe it's adding a different process, which would be the site planning approval process for the residential. And maybe that's the component that we add, but we add it for residential only. And, and so with, I mean, the, we have the opportunity to do that and that there's certainly no inconsistencies with that. And 
potentially it can be even um, it can be even broken up into a commercial and industrial section and a residential section so you so you know specifically because a condominium association is not required for commercial and industrial state law yeah. is very clear it's only required when you do residential fine site plans yes. you mean? yeah so uh, the the opportunity exists where we can do that and that is something that we could bring forward if there's agreement um, during the the public hearing is we we can look at that hybrid and that and and how the two can fall under the same chapter but be different I, I think that I'd like to explore that because I think this reads really it makes sense in the residential context where you need that certainty about a lot of that stuff but I think it might um, it might actually reduce flexibility for the commercial industrial uses where where you need that flexibility to respond to the market. Um, and I mean, I don't know, it sounds like you might have an idea about how that might reconcile, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I'd be interested in that because I would hate to lose that knowing that really the vast majority of them to date have been commercial and industrial in nature. Right. Um, okay. Otherwise you might have people doing, just to extrapolate this out, you might have people doing the full site plan for a commercial business park and then having to do a ton of lot line adjustments like every time someone comes in and you go, oh shoot, we didn't create that parcel the right size for that guy. We got to do a lot line adjustment and you know, you end up with like layer upon layer. Right. Yeah. The, con the concept, it goes, it goes twofold and that is um, we've, we've had situations in um, county approved binding site plans where they're coming in for specifics now within the city and they're at the end and there hasn't been a lot of thought as to how they're going to get to the end because they're going parcel by parcel by parcel. And so when you get to the end, you're left with these odd remnants of what do we do with them? And it, so it, it kind of can go both ways, I guess, is it, is it requires some future thought and some planning into how you're going to do your infrastructure to serve your development, but at the same time, wanting the flexibility to be able to respond and being able to still demonstrate that you can provide that infrastructure, and I'm only talking about commercial and industrial, okay. where you can provide that infrastructure still to the same level. Yeah, maybe there's like a halfway point where you right. lay out your primary, what might be the public roads or something and where the utilities are gonna go to make sure that the city gets the connectivity they need and, and the main like fire access and through fares, but mm -hmm then you stop at that point or something. So you get you, you yeah. get that protection you're talking about that we need, but still provide some flexibility. Right. I'd be open to seeing what you guys have to say about, um, I guess, like you called it a hybrid of sorts, where there's maybe a different set of standards for residential than there is for commercial and industrial. Okay. Unless we all six other members of the commission are not interested in pursuing that. No, I, I, I agree. That seems to make a lot of sense. It, it seems like different goals for the for the patterns of development. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, different different goals different, we're trying to achieve yeah, with the two. Different yeah. objectives. Mike? So in, in the residential portion of this, how does the phasing work compared, you know, question. you were talking about the five-year limit on preliminary um, plats. How, you know, and the, the specific site plan, the specific binding site plan seems to let you go and do that piece by piece um, that Ollie's talking about. How does that phasing work on this version of the residential? The residential would be then almost identical to how we do, pretty much to how this is written right now. So you have your approved site plan, you go through and you construct your infrastructure for that necessary um, to support your phase. So let's say you have 200 units and you want your first phase to be 50. Then you'd go in and you would build your infrastructure according to the approved site plan, enough to support those 50 lots and then you record your binding site plan and your condo decks and all of that for the first 50. And then you'd come in and you'd do the next and then you would just sequentially keep going. And that's called the approved site plan? It's there would sort of the be a preliminary, we, it's called preliminary binding site plan approval and that's what approves the site plan, at least that's how it's proposed now. So that would be similar to what the residential would be. And that's for a portion of the greater? It would be for the entire site. Residential is kind of, um, it is different because it does, there, it does necessitate that beginning and end. You, you need to know the plan. 
and mostly for infrastructure and just for um, pedestrian connectivity. I mean, just um, planning your open spaces. There, there's, a, there's a lot of um, necessity in, in looking at a site plan for a residential um, proposal. Building it in phases, what's most important then is just providing what's necessary to support each phase. That, that's the key with that. Um, as opposed to commercial industrial, completely different. And I agree, there is a distinction um, with com how commercial industrial develops. Yeah. Although we're seeing, as we get to the end of some of these binding site plans, these remnants. But yeah. it's, it's not enough to cause a lot of alarm, but it does happen. Kathy, on, on the, uh, you were talking about condominiums coming in uh, in phases. Condomin uh, will those then all be blended together in one condominium association or layered associations? Are they different ones? They do, and like they do right now for preliminary plats is they'll do covenants for the first phase, and then what they'll do is in that first set of covenants, they basically establish that there's going to be um, X amount of phases or this is what the whole subdivision is. And then each time they do a phase, they amend those co covenants by incorporating those new lots into the first set of covenants. The condo declaration, they effectively do the same thing where they establish the declaration for the whole. And then when they do the declaration, say for the second phase, they may define in their more common limited elements and, and just common elements that um, given the nature of what they're filing, but then both condominium associations are now required for the whole, right? So they continue to amend the declaration and it grows and grows so everybody is responsible. So there'd be one uniform body governing There is, involved. yes. Okay. Yep. You know, just looking at this, reading all the way through, it may be just a matter of capturing that difference in the phasing component. I, I'll leave it to you guys to kind of think yeah. about it, but you know, it may be. I think it's the site plan and the phasing yeah. are the two issues that we're discussing. You may be able yes. to capture an industrial a commercial one by just having a different kind of, a different set of standards for the phasing. So you don't have to lock out exactly what each phase is going to be, but if you yes. had that potential to phase with flexibility, that might, instead of having two completely separate sets of rules. Yes. Yeah. Yep. No, but I think those are good, good, uh, I think that's a good discussion. Does anybody else have comments on the binding site plan section for now? And keep in mind, I, we didn't even mention this, but the idea is we're going to go through all this, but this isn't like the be all end all. If you come up with something later, like we were talking about before the meeting, we're going to circle back to staff on everything, right? So um, anything else right now? No. Kurt? Oh, yeah. No, no he's oh, going to. Okay. Um, do we want to entertain comment per section or at the end? Or um, how I think do we, we should do it do at that? the end. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. So at the very beginning, um, when we started this, um, some of the key issues we identified is that our existing subdivision regulations are not uh, compliant with state law. This would be one of those areas. So the question of whether or not we need to have an alteration and vacation um, provisions. We do. The question is whether or not what's being proposed is what is sufficient. State law is very vague in what the alteration is and what the process is, and they are somewhat vague in um, the plat vacation. So to differentiate between the two, a plat alteration is when you have a final plat, which is a recorded plat, and you are proposing to amend it or alter it. And that can be and, and if definitely many, many different ways. Um, the state does not define what an alteration is. So in some part, we will help define what that is. And um, all of that is not here yet because a lot of that will go into the definition section. And, and one of the things, um, Mike and Iris, for your benefit is as we have these discussions, if there's these key words that are coming up, um, we've intentionally held back the definition section so that where we struggle in our conversation or what does that mean, then obviously that's the key that we need to define that. 
an alteration is something to some degree we're going to need to define as to what that is as well as a vacation. Um, the alterations that we've currently had in the city is we've had um, a couple where there has been a parcel within a final plat that is large enough to further subdivide. And we've had one, actually both of them, ironically, um, there was one parcel and they were able to further subdivide for a total of three lots. So two new or three total. Um, we've had plat alterations where there were uh, conditions associated with the development of the lot that the developer um, did not want to pursue for reasons. And so we went forward to the hearing examiner to alter the conditions of the plat. So an alteration can take many forms, but the key here is that this is an already created parcel. So this is not a preliminary plat that is still undecided of what it's gonna be. The concept here, this is literally and figuratively, but when you buy into a neighborhood, the idea is you can look at that plat map, know what's gonna to be to the right of you, to the left of you, across the street and behind you. And if that changes, there's a process that you go through. And that's what the alteration process is. A vacation, which we don't see very often, if ever, actually, at least in our current time, is say that there is a subdivision. Um, well, that's not true. We've done this in a very backwards way because we didn't have a plat vacation process. So effectively, we have a lot of what we call paper plats done at the turn of the century. So you have your 25 by 100 foot wide lots and 20 lots in a row creating a block with alleys and streets that make absolutely no sense to the current topography, critical areas, how you can serve them with utilities, it makes no sense. How we do that is we, go th we have gone through, and at least in a couple that I can think of on the south side, and we have vacated the rights of way. And then they've gone in and replatted it. What they could have the opportunity to do is concurrently is just vacate the whole plat and then rededicate and to go through this process. So basically what a vacation is, is, is erasing lot lines that were previously filed for record at the auditor's office is really what it's doing. Um, we do not believe that this will be highly used. A lot of what you find here in the vacation is straight out of straight state law. I looked and scoured many other municipalities and almost everybody just references state law. Vacations shall go to RCW 5817, whatever it is. They don't even put them in their code from the perspective of trying to do anything about them. So what you find here is not much more than that. It's a regurgitation pretty much of what's in state law. But from a user's perspective, if we're going to do something for alterations, which we're going to add a little bit to the alteration process, you might as well put the vacation in and just put it all in one place. So that was our thought behind that. Um, so when we look on the first page under 010, that's predominantly 100% out of state law. So A and B is what the state says. When we go to the next page and we go into alterations, this is where staff um, is proposing our process and what requires, uh, what process is required for what type of alteration. And so effectively, what we are proposing here is that if the alteration, um, if an alteration results in five or more lots, then it goes through the preliminary plat process. If an alteration creates four or less, it goes through the short plat process. If you have a filed plat that was a preliminary plat, so 10 lots or more, and you want to change a condition, then that goes through the preliminary plat process. If you have a short plat that had a condition and you want to amend that condition, it goes through the short plat process. So what we did is we tried to establish thresholds. 
and to what the review process was. So hearing examiner would approve the alteration of the creation of five or more lots and any modification to a condition on a final plat, which is something that initiated 10 lots or more. All others would be administrative. So just so we all understand, the two scenarios that we took forward that created a total of three lots, they both went to the hearing zone, but we would propose that they go to an, or go through an administrative process. Still required, um, and because they were part of a subdivision, they should already have curb gutter sidewalk. Everything is there. So this isn't necessarily the need to get infrastructure because the infrastructure was already there as a part of the platting process. So this is really about notice is really what it is. Who makes the decision and how is it noticed? The notice goes out to the same number of people. It's just who's reviewing it and who's making the decision. And it's a, it's a lot threshold is, is um, what we're proposing. The thing that's interesting about state law too is it says that there's, um, well actually I put it under O2OB and it says a folly action shall be applied for blah, blah, blah. And it says that, um, that a public hearing um, is not required unless it's requested by a person, you know, who received notice. That's in state law right now. So the opportunity exists for that. So we could keep it as staff is proposing to have that opportunity where the hearing is optional or just require it outright. I mean, those are, those are the two scenarios. We have not exercised under state law the ability for an optional or that the hearing to be requested. We've just requested it because we said the hearing examiner or that the director is going to request it. So we have not exercised that opportunity, but we're putting that in here now. The director would still have the authority to say a hearing is required. So two things. Lot threshold for the review process and decision maker, and the other is hearing. Do we want the ability to take the opportunity that a hearing doesn't necessarily have to be required, or should it out, be outright required under those alterations requiring hearing examiner approval? So those are probably the key factors just within that one little section, but because it's brand new and we haven't really worked with it a lot, I think that it, the discussion is warranted to make sure that we're really trying to iron through this and see if it's really going to work. Is first, that helpful? Garrett, you have a comment. The first thing I would ask, though, after Garrett comments is if anybody doesn't understand that clearly, please chime in so Kathy can clear, because it is a complex idea, I think. But yeah, go ahead. My, when you're talking about hearing, you're talking about public hearing, mm -hmm. not hearing examiner whether or not to hold yes, a hearing. that is correct. Be a public hearing. That's okay. Um, so if it's administrative decision for an alteration, it's four or less lots, that would be the planning director? That is correct. And then would an applicant have an opportunity to appeal to the hearing examiner if they didn't find the director's decision yes. favorable? Yes, yes. But that doesn't need to be written here. That's just part of the type. Well, because it follows process. a short plat process and it takes you to 1812, so that kicks you there that then has that process. So that same, actually takes you to Same 20. thing with the appeal of a hearing examiner. Be yes. Yep. Okay. Because when you go to 1812, um, then it says you shall follow Title 21. And Title 21 is where it describes everything that, yes. I mean, just, just in general, I think it's a good tool to have. Uh, you know, discretion, I know you're trying to achieve some thresholds with lot, you know, sizes. I think it's a good idea to have as much, you know, discretion that doesn't require cumbersome process if it, if it makes sense. And it's hard to say that, you know, just because it's smaller and below a threshold means that it's not, you know, doesn't need that kind of vetting. It's hard to put those thresholds in place, but I think you've got to try to start somewhere. And it seems like a size of that magnitude you know, four lots or less seems appropriate to me. When you're looking at noticing, uh, there's still be a noticing, you know, signage, mailing to f people within a 500 foot yep. radius. And if it was an administrative decision, 
if somebody wanted to hold a public hearing, they could make that request and then that request would be granted? Or is that part of the discussion of whether or not that would be an option? This, the way that it is written right now is, is that if it is requested by a person who received notice. So anyone could request that. So I guess in some ways the thought is an applicant coming into this would sort of think the converse of that, that the hearing is required unless it's requested, unless it's not requested. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a different way of saying the same thing. It, it, I guess it's a different mindset. And Does the state law require that or is that a provision that has just been added? No, the state, that's what the state says. So, so if one person who yes. receives notice, there's nothing, you can't undo that. that right. That's an option. And the, and the other thing I want to um, specify this, and, and I, I do need to clarify one thing um, that I should have when you said notice for an alteration is different than notice for any other application. And the notice only goes to people within the original subdivision. So we don't do mailings within the 500 feet, which actually is quite interesting, but that's what state law says, is that you shall give notice um, to all those within the subdivision. And, and we take that to mean every phase of the subdivision. So if you had one phase that was five lots, and that's the, the lot that you're in, and there's 15 more phases, it's the whole subdivision. It's up to where you know it's been phased. It's not just the one phase of the subdivision that you're in. Gotcha. Lisa? Just to make sure I understand that correctly. So even, so only the people in the subdivision is notified. So adjoining property homeowners are not notified of a change, even though that change could impact their adjoining property? That is how it is proposed right now, and that is what is consistent with state law. There's nothing in state law that would prohibit a broader notification. But know that if we do that, then that mo in most circumstances would have a broader notification than any other because you would be notifying not only everyone within the subdivision that's required by state law, you would then also be going 500 feet around. The idea being is that that plat is a basis for why people bought into that. And I understand what you're saying because that could be someone next door saying the same thing even though they're not within that subdivision. So that's why I'm glad that Garrett said that because that is a provision in state law and we're carrying over state law. So then that's the question of should we broaden the notification to be consistent with what we do but know that it may be broader than standard because the subdivision could reach further than the 500 feet. And you mentioned that the director also retains the right to call yes. a hearing. So if yes. something came in and the director thought, hey, this could impact people outside the subdivision, he could make that decision, he or she could make that decision. And then we wouldn't give the option for people to request it because it would already be known. There'd be known. And there would probably be a notice of application and public hearing. And what's the process today? To today in Bellingham, if you want to amend or alter a plat, you basically do a brand new plat. Process. We're doing a preliminary plat. And does that have a 500 foot notification requirement? The alteration? Yeah. No, it's all just within no. the subdivision. Okay, so if you, if I had a subdivision under the current rules and I wanted to alter it, I would go through the full preliminary plat process, but my notification would only be within that plat. Within the subdivision, gotcha. that's how okay. we've done them. Iris? So is this process then, or the proposed process versus, um, excuse me, um, rewriting your plat, is, it's a shorter process? The alteration? The alteration process? Um, it, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, it would be... It sounds like it creates some ease in terms of what you need to, to redraw. Yeah, if you were the smaller ones, like less than four yeah, lots, for and example. Yeah, and that's where I was trying to articulate, articulate that, but it's like a short plat. And that, that was kind of the thought behind it, is that you can do a short plat in the city, four lots or less with no notification. It's an administrative decision. And that's the reason why the four was chosen. Because if you do a short plat from, nine, from five to nine lots, we do send out notification. And so that's why that was bumped up. Even though they're short plats and administrative decisions, and we're proposing to take alterations five or more to the hearing examiner level, potentially, um, it was the noticing 
is because of, mm -hmm. of how and who and who when we notice what the thresholds are for noticing. So, not necessarily. It just really depends on okay. the proposal. I think if you can think about this in the context of if you've got an existing subdivision and you want to alter that, um, we currently don't have anything in our code. We look to the state law for it. So having it in our code is probably a really good thing so that we can manage it. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to manage it just like we would manage our other short plot processes. So if you had a blank piece of land out there that hadn't been subdivided before and you wanted to come in and, and subdivide that, you would go through the same process you would for the alteration or for the new. Yeah, there's consistency between us, the way you've written it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I and I, I guess to Lisa sort of dovetail, and maybe this is what Kurt said, but I'm going to just try to say it in maybe my own words, if that's helpful, is you could have a same size parcel that's never been platted next to somebody that can come in and short plat it and not receive notice. So. We, we, we have chosen a, a, um, a thresholds for notification and four lots and less don't require notification. So the same scenario could exist. It just happens that state law has said that if you're within a final plat, you shall go through a process. Different, they define certain things that need to happen. And we're trying to add to that. So it's not uncharacteristic of other scenarios we have, I guess. And that's why the four lots were chosen. Uh, can, can you do an alteration if there's buildings constructed? Yes. Okay. Just like and you can short plat property that has exist, exist, existing structures on it, we just make sure that the new lot lines conform to setbacks and they meet open space, parking, and just. So under the current law, why wouldn't you or couldn't you just do a short plat on four or less to accomplish this? Because state law says you can't. State law says when any person is interested in the alteration <coughs> of any subdivision, which is a recorded final plat, or the alteration of any portion thereof. So state law is very clear that if you are going to alter a final plat, then there is something you need to do, which is not a short plat. And then what about the conversation about resubdividing every five years? So that's under short, that's actually when you short plat parcels. And so what that says under short plats, and we've actually um, modified the provisions, um, we've, we've expanded state law a bit, I guess you could say. And what state law says, and, and um, first of all, just take a little bit, step out. State law says that short plats are only four lots or less. Five and more is a, is a subdivision. However, the local municipalities can choose to have five to nine lots to be a short plat. We've mm -hmm. taken that choice. Mm -hmm. So five to nine lots are short plats. The difference between a one to four and a five to nine is not only the notification we've talked about, but it's also the street improvement requirements. Mm -hmm. So what we've said is that if you're gonna do a five to nine, you're gonna be held to the same standards of, of improvements, public infrastructure improvements, as you would if you were a subdivision. So what the state wanted to prohibit is someone coming in, having a big parcel, doing a four lot short plat, right. leaving a big residual, coming back immediately, doing a four lot short plat, and then a four lot short plat, and a four lot short plat, because then you don't get the public infrastructure that is intended when you're doing five or more lots. Right. So that's the prohibition, is it says you cannot create more than four lots from a parent parcel within five years unless you go through the uh, subdivision process. And then you're into the whole process of providing the subdivision infrastructure and all of that. Okay. Is that helpful? That helps, thanks. Okay. You did your homework. You're that <laughs> or you're like a developer somewhere in your past or something. That's, <laughs> I'm, you too, Iris, that. I'm impressed. Thank you. Anybody else have questions on this one? Uh, let me see, just make sure. If oh, sorry, you're not done, are you? Well, no, I just want to make sure. Th that, that was really the biggie. Um, again, vacations are pretty much state law. Um, and 
know that there's a definite distinction if you're proposing to vacate a street as opposed to vacating a plat, and that takes a completely different process. So this is not that. Garrett? So if you want to change the condition, there's no room for administrative uh, discretion there, and that's because it was a hearing examiner order? Yes. And so you're saying it just has to go back to the hearing examiner. Okay. But yeah. does it, unless, does it still have to go to the hearing examiner if nobody asks for it? No. Then we so can, you, then there we is some can discretion. do it. Yeah, then we can amend it administratively. Yeah, because if you ask if for a condition no change and nobody says, hey, I want to have a hearing, then they can just do it. Right. Oh. But so I, I was understanding from him that we can't just administratively do it without going through a process. No, yeah. That's so... Okay. Maybe I didn't understand but, that. Yeah, but that section B, when you say accept that a public hearing is not required, that means you don't have to go to the hearing examiner. Right. Gotcha. Does that, that open the potential for kind of a legal issue? If you know you have a hearing examiner order, which there's a certain appeals process, that maybe a year later is administratively repealed. I mean, they would have the ability to appeal that decision. Hmm. Okay. Know that if my, my hunch would be if during the planning process, the preliminary plat review, there was a condition imposed and there was a lot of public comment and interest and they wanted to come in and to amend that, the chances are the decision is that has, that has public interest sure. and that that would go to the hearing examiner. So there's the level of um, concerns. The, the, the one, for example, um, that we modified is there was, a, um, there was a period of time where we were putting design provisions um, for the single family residences in our subdivision. And um, th there, there was a plat that was purchased and the developer didn't want to do that. And so they came and asked the hearing examiner to um, remove that condition. That, that was the scenario. There was, and there was no public comment on that. So that would be the type of scenario, scenario where we would look at this and say, you know, send out notice, is it necessary or is that something that we feel? Iris, do you have a comment? Yeah, uh, you shared that the state um, within the RCW that there isn't um, very many parameters around alterations. Is there the um, potential for the state to go back into that RCW and say we need to define this more narrowly and then different municipalities have painted themselves into corners and well um, considering it has not been modified since 1987 um, I, we're assuming it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty broad so so a lot of the state guidelines are very broad and the, and the municipalities go in and, and add more specificity to it. Obviously, our, our regulations cannot conflict, but we can certainly add more specificity um, to that. And um, we know one change they're, at least we're hoping they make, and that is um, the, they don't have to submit uh, final milers to the city anymore, and also to that the planning director will have the authority to sign the final plats. So, I mean, slowly they're making changes, but I, I, I'm not anticipating. And so have other municipalities come up with various thresholds like this to try to help add some definition? There are very few that actually do this. A lot of them just reference. Hmm. Um, there are some in the same boat that we are that don't reference RC, that don't reference alterations and vacations, and there are some that just say you shall comply with 5817, and there are some that actually define process. So fewer that define process, we would be of the minority to do that. Because they're complicated. You, you mentioned that under that O2OB, the ability for the director to require that. Is that somewhere in our code? No, I added that. Should we, should we put it in there? I did. Did I you added, do that? Because I, I wrote a note that said, I added yeah. that, comma, yeah. or if the director, yeah. just so it's like clear for people. Yeah. Um, yep. Okay, cool. Yeah. So how I have it is except that a public hearing is not required unless the director determines the proposal likely to raise substantial planning issues or is a matter of public interest or is requested by a person, blah, yeah. blah, blah. I think that's a good ad. Um, so that's really, um, the rest is pretty, 
um, routine with the rest of the code, at least in the outline as to the staff report, hearing examiner, effective decision. Yeah. So the last of this is the binding site plan, which we need to have an alteration of vacation process for binding site plans, but I guess knowing where we just had the discussion, I'd like the opportunity to tailor this to, to be consistent with how we propose it with um, a revised binding site plan chapter. Does that seem fair? Yeah. I'm not sure that it's worthy having an in-depth discussion of something that is somewhat tailored after a chapter that we want modified. So um, we will rewrite that accordingly. Would you come from moving on to, to variances? Yeah, this one's exciting. I, oh. I have one last question on yeah, vacations. Yep. Is, an, is an alteration only taking a lot and making smaller lots within it? Or is it, can you also do like, say you have three lots and you wanted to vacate and then make new lines that were five. Like, can you, is it just getting smaller or can it be like shifting? Do, do you vacate and then subdivide or can you alter that? You, you could alter. You could alter, you wouldn't have to vacate and then alter because effectively what we would say is your site is those three lots and that you would be resubdividing those three, say, into five. Um, and you, you could do that. Um, one of the things that is very clear f that is not required to require an alteration is a lot line adjustment. So if you have two lots in a, final, in a filed plat and you, for whatever reason, want to adjust the lot lines, that is not an alteration. That is a lot line adjustment. So there are things that are, that is probably about the only thing exempt because even though you are altering, yeah. but it is not what is intended here. And it actually speaks to that, so. Thanks. All right. Okay, um, variances and administrative departures. Thank you. So I guess what I would like to first, I'd like to jump around and, and go to the variance procedure first and then talk about the administrative departure. So 030 first and then 040. And what we would like to present to the Planning Commission is that this variance process is working well. We have not proposed any changes. And we have received feedback from our hearing examiner that this criteria um, is good criteria in that it doesn't necessitate that you have to have a hardship. Most variance criteria is they demonstrate that you have that you, in order to get a variance, you have to demonstrate a hardship. That's one A, but then one B also gives you the opportunity to um, to expand on that. And so, some of the things that you'll see here means better design. Well, what does that mean? And so, you can see that I've already begun to think about what is better design. And those are some things that we may have to define what better design is or we may choose to leave it up to each unique situation as it comes forward so that we can best evaluate it because each, um, each situation, each variance is taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, something disconnected under the table that it might be Phyllis's, um, it's nothing? Okay, sorry. So we would like to propose, at least at this point, to keep the variance the same. No, there's some thought into whether or not we do need to define what better lot design is if it's necessary. So far, we haven't found a need for that. Um, it's just, it really was meant for more of a come back to. Garrett? So this is, this is how it's written right now. Yes. This is existing, yeah. I, I hesitate a little to, to get to try to define too much what a better lot design is, it, I think it, the burden is on the 
applicant to demonstrate that it's a better design and for what reasons may not be I don't know that you'd be able to list them all and, and when you start to list things like topography and critical area it kind of brings you back to what might be perceived as a hardship because you know instead of just it's better okay I, I, I would tend to want to leave it more open and put the burden of proof on the applicant to demonstrate that it is better and then that's why you have the hearing or that's why you have that variance procedure The original idea, um, and there are many provisions within our, our codes that deal with this, the, the original idea here is um, we had the, we had the um, requirement for pipe stems. And the idea was, could you create the same means of access without having to create these pipe stems? so that you could demonstrate you met code, but then you could create a better situation with a variance. And so that was kind of the, the original concept behind that. Um, and so that we, we were just trying to go through with some thoughts, but if, if we generally don't feel it's necessary and let it be um, case by case and site by site specific as it is today, then we can definitely um, follow with that direction. Anybody have thoughts on that? I kind of sympathize with Garrett a little bit just in the sense that it, if you if you try to define it too much you start to lose the whole idea which is that you're you're asking for something special with a variance. Um, some you know some guidance some guidance might be okay but taking it too far or getting too specific might um, might make like it pointless, kind of. And maybe avoid code that says it's similar to, but not limited to, but like. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> as often we can try to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, administrative departure. So going back to O two O. This is brand new. And um, th this is um, this was drafted or crafted, however you want to phrase that, um, from Rick. And we feel we feel pretty strongly that. Um, and, and again, you don't have the benefit right now of the of reviewing the standards that we'll be presenting um, next time in terms of what really starts to take the shape of a subdivision. Um, but we 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 want some administrative flexibility, but understanding it needs to be limited flexible or um, it needs to be limited in what our administrative authority is. And so A defines what a departure is, and then B, it goes down to um, basically what, <coughs> what needs to be demonstrated in order to qualify or um, for the director to approve a departure. And then we move on to, um, so B is basically the criteria, and then C is trying to define um, what prescriptive measurements, because those are the easy, easiest things to depart from, because there's something you can measure. Uh, what prescriptive standards um, should be able to be departed from? And as I was reading through this, prepping um, for this work session, I guess in some ways, and um, I want Kurt to weigh in on this too, is we talk about the floor area ratio in number four under the infill housing, because that's one of the issues that we, um, we receive a lot of comments about, especially when you move into the realm of a subdivision, because the floor area is much different when you have more land than when you have a small infill lot, say of six, seven, 10,000 square feet, as opposed to acres. 
But as I think about number four, I guess in part my question would be um, through the subdivision provisions as to whether or not we can take this administrative departure provision instead of what's in the infill toolkit from modifications and wondering if we can in the subdivision realm use this administrative departure criteria as opposed to what's in the infill toolkit modification. Like, in can, the re you, in the can reason you for legally that? use Title 18 to vary from a standard in Title 20, 30, whatever? We do 20. Is. 20 says it shall override anything in 18. Yeah. What is the modifications in uh, the infill toolkit? It requires a hardship. Yeah, it does. And so that's sort of what I'm thinking is that if, if from administrative departure, if, if we're moving it be, because the departures are, they're, they're minor, they're very minor departures because we're talking 90%. Um, so if, if we're talking about something administrative, and I, I'm just throwing this out for the first time and like it's brand new to my thought as well, but that's why we're having a work session, um, is to whether or not that that is something that we should further explore as to what are the, you know, try to guess what the unintended consequences are, but also to maybe identify what the positives of doing that would be. I have a thought on, I think these are pretty minor as far as the scale of what impact they would have uh, with regard to infill housing you get down to tight sites, tight site design, that 10% could be critical on making something feasible or not. In the way it's written currently that a modification requires some kind of hardship, you know, that's pretty narrowly defined. I think it would be a really good tool to be able to have an administrative departure with limits that would apply to the infill housing. I'll, I think it's good to have in the subdivision ordinance in general. Um, <laughs> for, for somebody to change a setback or uh, by uh, six inches because it makes sense to have to go to a, to a variance, they're probably not going to do it, but it might make sense to do. So that's my thought on both those. So I'm reading departures achieve a better outcomes and then that it's the idea is that it would be in better serve the public interest. Can you give me an example of what would, how you would define if something better served the public interest? Um, it could be through design. Um, there's a lot of opportunities we have um, or there's, we, we lack a lot, a lot of opportunities for good design. So say um, in order to add like a front porch to a building, you know, or to allow um, a subdivision to encroach, you know, into setbacks um, and create a better streetscape. Um, maybe, um, maybe you have scenarios where uh, it makes sense to reduce a setback um, so that you can create a wider lot. Mm -hmm. So you're reducing a setback to create a wider lot that's more in character with the neighborhood. So the mm -hmm. perception of being the public benefit is that it's now more in character with, mm -hmm. um, similar to lot width and lot depth. Okay. I mean, they're really, limp they're endless do opportunities of where we could go with that. Following on that, do you, would you see like a scenario that where a say lot width and lot depth variation would allow an additional density to be achieved not like let's say the, the property has 10 densities but you can only get six but if you were allowed some minor minor variation just the way it laid out you could get that seventh lot is that in the public interest in light of our like complaint goals and policies regarding infill and things like that I mean can you go can you stretch that far um, I wouldn't say you're stretching. I would say the underlying zoning, if it allows for seven units, then you have the potential to reach the seven units. And if it's not through administrative departure, because you can't get there, you'd still have the ability potentially to go through the variance. Yeah. So, yes, again, but depending on the certain circumstances. Yeah, on the circumstances. Like yes. Maybe that's not appropriate, right. but maybe it is. Right. Yeah. And we realize this at the very beginning is that 
The zone densities aren't changing with this document, but what this can and may do is realize the built density is getting closer to the zone density in some circumstances. So density is not changing, at least the zone density is not changing. The built density could actually increase. Um, these are so minor though, and we do see um, situations where someone has a 100 foot wide lot and you have a 50, um, 50 foot lot width requirement and the house just happens to be four foot from the property line. So you have to create a five foot setback from the new property line and you'll end up with a 49 foot wide lot. I don't know that there are many people that can walk down the street and go, oh, that's 49 feet. And that one's 51, they clearly aren't. So it's really meant to be used in very small scale situations, but where they can be used, the benefit will be tremendous because the process that they have to go through now is extraordinary. 90% a little restricted. It's, it's a question. Question, Steve. It's almost like when we were talking, we'll get there, but we were talking about the lot averaging mm -hmm. and the standards and like for a really big lot, maybe it's yes. different than it is for a small lot because mm -hmm. on a small lot, 90% won't do you, like a foot, I don't know do you, but you know, so maybe that, I have a feeling that we might circle back to this when we start getting into the standards because there's some correlate, like that's kind of what Kathy said, right? Is there some correlation between the two? Yeah, and I think actually um, building on what we've done, because if you recall, both in our short plotting process and in our preliminary plot process, we've talked about having modifications associated with that already. So we've kind of already talked about that. Yeah. And there was additional work that you directed us to go look at and to, to explore in that area. So I think what might be a good idea is to take kind of the direction that you've given us in those past two chapters and then apply that here. Um, I think that one good thing or one thing that we would request is it, a little more discussion about the 90%. Is 90% too restrictive? Should we look at something more? Is there a threshold? Um, any sort of guidance you can give us on that would be very helpful. It's hard because there's so many different situations. So here, just to give you a little sneak preview, the trailer to next time. <laughs> um, for lot averaging, what we, what at least is written in, in draft form, it says that um, basically that lots, um, that result in lots having site areas less than the minimum lot size provided no lot with a minimum lot size greater than that equal to 10,000 square feet. So if your zoning is 10,000 square feet, we can go 80%. If you have a zoning or minimum lot size that's 10,000 square feet or less, um, then you go 90%. So what we've tried to do is establish a threshold, and, and I think about it in very simple terms, I know it's not this simple, but if you're walking down the street, are, is it going to be significantly noticeable? 80% of 50 feet is a lot more noticeable than 80% of a 10,000 square foot lot. So when, when you start to think about that degree and that measurement and some of the discussions that we'll have, and this came from Lisa's original um, comment when we first presented this, is I, I don't know, we don't know that 10,000 square feet is the appropriate cutoff, but it's a, it's a starting place, it's a, it's a place for discussion. And so the question is, is there a similar place for discussion of having an 80 and a 90% possibly Steve is suggesting, or is it just a straight percent? I mean, we're, we're willing to look and explore, and then obviously in the hearing we'll come back with, you know, maybe some real life examples of what does this mean? You know, let's look at something and apply it, um, and see where we go from there. That's more generous in if you're big. Right, the idea is it's more generous if you're in a bigger lot. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa? You partially answered a little bit because I was um, thinking about the 90% also and the cumulative effect. If it applied across to each parcel of land in a large development or is it 90% for the total development? Um, but I think addressing threshold because um, 
it may not be enough across a larger development, larger section of land. 90% might be um, not as effective as maybe an 80%. So I know we like to have everything really streamlined, but I think in the benefit of smart development and infill, um, the larger track of land, um, more greenfield could maybe have a different standard applied to it compared to more of the infield having a smaller, you know, the smaller the lot size, like you said, you know, one foot compared to, you know, adjustment may not be as noticeable, but if we're looking at, you know, and I think if it's a, a large greenfield development, even looking at what you think would be a smart threshold, um, if 80% is enough for that, it would be nice to see some examples of mm -hmm. what that would look like, even if we went to something like 70 or 75 um, for areas that are not necessarily abutting established neighborhoods. Okay. Yeah, Thanks, Lisa. A, that's a good point. I had the same question as Steve, is 90% too restrictive? I think the idea be, behind having a departure is that you're allowing some discretion on administrative level to make a good decision. And if you, you know, if you try to define it too narrowly, then they, the good decision might be at a lower threshold and they just can't do it because, again, now we're pinned in. So uh, I tend to be more trusting, I suppose, that, you know, good decisions when the intent is well defined can be made on an administrative level if it makes sense. Uh, I think the flexibility is nice to have. I had a question though, just on when you're defining departure as a request for an applicant to uh, meet or exceed a particular standard through the use of a technique or alternative standard not otherwise listed. So if you were to go for say a setback or a lot depth, do you have to meet definition A if you're going for a departure on one of these items listed in C? Sort of. Well, and that's where I was really hoping that Rick was going to be here to discuss that component because I think B and C fall together really well. And yeah. I think the departure um, can be, I, I, don't, I don't know necessarily that the first sentence is, is important of just saying the departures are not variances are not required to meet all those associated. So I don't know that the first sentence is necessary or it seems often conflicting to what yeah. we're that, that was my only concern. I thought maybe we could get some clarification on that because okay. it it seems like the intent is is what 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 it's trying to state is that if you if you have a better way if this yes. is an improvement right. you, you're you're meeting another standard or goal of this you know the code yep. will allow for some departures but. It does seem, it could also be read that you have to meet A before you could apply for right. B or C, so. Agreed. Okay. Iris, you had a comment? I'm just curious reading the first sentence as well, where the, um, what's the incentive for the applicant if there's a, if it, um, if a departure would be to the, to pub the benefit of public interest, but it might not be to their interest, is that this sort of null and void, so it has to come, this has to come from the applicant. Because in desire. some because in some scenarios um, they don't have the hardship they don't have what it would take to get a variance but what they're seeking is so minor so it's it's sometimes it's the opportunity to fulfill um, or to realize the zoning and whereas you otherwise might not be able to, and then it provides that opportunity for infill and um, development that's in character with mm -hmm. the rest of the neighborhood. So it, it could mean development as opposed to development that may not otherwise be able to be realized, and we may have a 10,000 square foot lot sitting in a neighborhood that has all 5,000 square foot because they may not have the hardship to get a variance or okay. some other scenario. Okay. Yeah. This is, and um, we, we, we talked about this before, and that is th this should be and is tailored really more for the infill opportunities. And, and that's where we're probably going to realize the most benefit from this, of what we see in those situations where there is something existing that we're trying to work on and 
how you develop those types of situations are very critical because there typically is an established character there already, and this will help us realize that. Lisa? Eventually, um, bulk and scale will be coming forward at some point, and I can see where that would be important to dovetail with this, especially if we're doing a variance in uh, an established neighborhood. So if we're allowing development on a smaller lot size to try to keep, um, you know, within the neighborhood character, um, there, there needs to be some kind of mechanism that someone's not going to put a big McMansion in an area that may not be appropriate. And I don't know how to be able to address that um, in this. I mean, I, I think, you know, when we give the example of a 49-foot <coughs> lot with instead of 50, you're not going to be able to tell, but that's providing that the bulk and scale of the building being put in is, you know, similar. So is there going to be some method to be able to utilize, you know, like this design is not appropriate to give this variance because it's not within bulk and scale? Is that? So I'll, I'll sort of counter that for discussion purposes. Um, We often find where those rare infill lots are that exist that require no subdivision or anything. Um, sometimes the bulk and scale of those newly constructed homes fit in well, sometimes they don't. Um, there would be nothing to preclude someone, which this has happened in the Cornwall Park neighborhood up by um, the Hagen um, and back of Hagen from demolishing single family homes that are, um, have had their life and have built homes that are clearly not within scale. However, the first person in, the second person matched the next person. So are they now establishing the new bulk and scale? The question that I would ask for discussion purposes is, the bulk and scale a subdivision related element or is that more of the development guidelines in terms of how we build our single family homes and how we regulate now we've done that in the infill toolkit we've looked at that that's how we that's what we do with our floor area ratio is we we look at that that proportionate scale but we have that nowhere else and the subdivision ordinance is trying to remove those attributes or those development standards and to, to let them live where they belong, like in Title 20 or Title 13 or wherever chapters they are. So I don't know that this is, meaning the subdivision ordinance is the appropriate place for bulk and scale. If we use the infill toolkit, of, of course it is, because that's a whole different set of regulations. Um, but, the in, but to develop on single family lots, you go to the single family chapter and you use those standards. So that's why I would ask, without commenting on whether the bulk and scale is a good idea, the question is, does that belong here or should that discussion happen in another set of regulations? I guess for discussion purposes. And just to add on to that, you, um, it's, it's a good point, but um, I think Kathy hit it right on is that it th that type of discussion doesn't belong here because we as a community have decided that we don't want design review for single family homes. We have set parameters, maximums of what you can build and what you can't build. Um, now, when you're talking about some of the older established in the historic neighborhoods, we do um, know that there there can be an issue with bulk and scale with some of those things. And that's why we've actually added that to our work item or our work program. So. Um, reviewing bulk and scale in older historic neighborhoods is on our 2017-18 work program and it's something that we we will be looking at um, so I think I think trying to separate these two is a, is a good idea um, there's there's two different conversations here should we allow this this minor um, difference in a lot width 48 48 feet 50 feet um, and then what should be built on that. And that, those are two different discussions, I think. So. 
Thank you. Anybody comment on that further? Um, I uh, I want to circle back briefly to the you brought up the infill toolkit and flurry ratio, and I just I'm going to make my case for how we address this. And you both know how I feel about this because we talked about it in other scenarios. But the the toolkit says it trumps Title 18. So I don't like the idea of trying to provide an administrative variance from, from in Title 18 from another code that says it trumps Title 18. I think that creates conflict. Um, I, and I think, um, I think it would be better to focus on changing the modification criteria within the toolkit because not every toolkit project is gotta have, gonna have a subdivision. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are five, six cottages or townhouses on one lot. You don't have to subdivide. So using the subdivision to capture that issue doesn't seem right to me for those two reasons. The toolkit trumps the subdivision, A, and B, not everybody doing a toolkit project uses the subdivision. So the, the more holistic solution to, to that issue when using the toolkit would be to change the toolkit rules. And I know that there's some issues associated with that, we've talked about them, but I, I would encourage you to stay away from trying to find toolkit solutions to the problems we know we're having through the subdivision ordinance or Title 20, 30, you know, residential single or whatever, or multi. I'd rather see us try and find a way to resolve the, the toolkit itself. And I know that that might be down the road a little ways. I'd rather wait personally and address that issue when the time comes to address that issue than try and find a, a stopgap solution here. Um, and that only applies to, to the FAR question, really, you know. Um, but, but really, even when you look at the other ones, like lot width and lot depth, if you do do a subdivision using the toolkit, the toolkit allows you to vary from the minimum lot standard. So you can have a lot that's like 18 feet wide, and yeah. I wouldn't feel it would be appropriate to start asking for administrative departures from that lot, which might be, then we get into this whole discussion about thresholds and, you know, so if the lot's under 2,000 square feet, do we only allow 97%? It just, to me, it just, it's like a long winding road that's not going to take us anywhere. So. My two cents, if you're looking at this section C, I would look at it in the context of traditional subdivisions only uh, and not in the toolkit context. And then I'd love to see the toolkit be fixed sooner rather than later, and I know we're not getting there, but I'd love to see that happen. Well, I can add, it's, it's very similar to the discussion we just had with bulk and scale. Is, um, you know, we have identified some minor revisions that need to occur in the toolkit. Um, it's it's on our 2017-18 work program. Um, just getting through all of our, you know, trying to line everything up um, is it's it's there. Um, we know that we will at least be bringing it back for discussion um, probably later this year. Yeah, and I think that's a better solution. And I'd yeah. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah. than trying to fix it here. Yeah, yeah that's something else. Yeah. Well, I just, I didn't think about it like that, but I, I think I mean, that's a good point. You're not cross-referencing between you know the subdivision ordinance and uh, fixing minor problems in the toolkit is probably a good idea. Just keep it clean. I, just to that to Ollie's point, I guess when we were doing our kind of code uh, cleanup, if you want to call it, just minor working items. The running list. Yeah, the running list. How come something like that wasn't on the running list, like the modification criteria. And, I mean, that seems easy. Yeah, I think um, th those are one of those things where we know that there are there are other um, work program items that we that we want to fix. So um, another really good example is Lake Walk and Watershed. We know that we've got changes that we need to make to Lake Walk and Watershed, but we've added that as a work program item versus something that we're gonna do in the minor code changes. So the whole concept behind the minor code changes was to take these, these kind of very specific individual tweaks and instead of doing this long process for each one individually, we kind of couch them together, do them in a group. Um, some of those other ones, like Aqua Watershed, Infill Toolkit, we know they're bigger discussions um, and probably shouldn't, they should probably have their own time and day versus trying to lump them into these kind of smaller code changes. Good answer. Does anybody else have anything on variances and administrative departures? So the last chapter, um, I would like to just close with we, this is a cut and paste, that's why it's a different font, everything looks different. I would just like to give the um, 
attorney's office to review it in our final draft as we bring forward to ordinance um, just as if this is what we want or not. I mean, basically, it's just our authority to impose fines and all the threats and everything else that can come with it. And I know that we've, we've changed many of our enforcements of what we do and just wanting to give that opportunity to have it, but to bring it up current to with how we're currently doing our enforcements. So. Anybody want to add any penalties? <laughs> <laughs> I like the bright red and everything. Yeah. Um, can you give us some examples of how somebody could in, almost inadvertently find themselves in this, or is this pretty obvious? They know when they're walking through the door that they're into the, he will be shot and hung and things like that. You know, you know in the too long of time that I've been doing this, we've, with a sub, with the actual subdivision itself, we have never used this chapter. It is really more with the use that goes on the lots that are created through subdivision is typically where the issues come. There are so many stop gap measures in the subdivision process that it is very hard to violate um, a provision of this title. So it's- I thought it was a joke at first. <laughs> I think it, what it does oh, is it, it gives us an opportunity in case someone goes out and, and creates a lot um, illegally and they try to sell it off. There, are, there's, it's interesting enough. There's state provisions mm -hmm. that help protect that. It's called innocent purchaser. Um, but this, this, like with all of our codes, we like to be able to enforce them, and this gives us that opportunity um, to do that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Kathy. That was really great. And I think I think that um, like generally, this is just my personal comment. Generally, this thing as we go, through, we've gone through like most of it now, and we just keep finding good things. I think in terms of providing administrative flexibility, I'm with Garrett in terms of like kind of trusting this administrative division to a certain degree, you know, to to make these calls and. Um, I just think like moving in that direction, you know, where we still have to like figure out how far we can go with it, but moving that direction I think is a positive thing. Um, I think it'll make, uh, I think it'll make for better, better design, better projects, more realization of the densities, those kinds of things at the end of the day. So, you know, I know we're not done yet, but just every time we go through these chapters, I'm like, oh, that, that's a, a lot of like good written in here, so. Do we want public comment? Um, yeah, we will take public comment. Okay. I just wanted to say that I think that when the flexibility comes in, um, there's a real difference between flexibility being imposed upon the applicant and flexibility as a result of the applicant making a suggested change. And so are there situations in here at all that we're looking at where somebody at the city level would say, I have a great idea, I think you should do it this way now. And is, does it go back upstream at all? At all? No. I, I think, I, I mean, I think there's times when the discussions occur. Mm -hmm. um, we typically aren't shy if we think we have a good idea, and we're usually pretty open to want to inquire as to why maybe something couldn't be better. Um, and sometimes it's thought of, and sometimes it's executed, and sometimes it's not. But um, there, there are times when we would like to be able to be creative and create something, help create something that's better, but it just doesn't quite fit. And these are the, the small thresholds or just, it's just enough to hopefully provide some of those opportunities that to the naked eye really isn't gonna be significant and it's just, but it's, it's just going to make it that much better. And it's really just trying to find those sweet spots. So if something's already been accepted and, and the city has a better idea, can, can they impose that upon somebody? Not or? if it's compliant with code, okay, no. We, we will not go back and do that. Thank you. We'll do that before. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 
Thank you. Um, we will provide an opportunity for public testimony if anybody wants to speak um, about this particular topic. You can come up to the microphone and share your thoughts with us for a short period of time. Um, is there anybody, and remember there will be a public hearing where we'll have formal, more formal comment opportunity after having seen an actual final document, final draft document from the city. Is there anybody here who'd like to make a comment on this? Mr. Ellison? Unfortunately, you have to come up to the microphone because we had to get you on the, on the record. Unless we could bring a mic to you. <laughs> and just let us know your name, please. Dave Edelstein, 2200 Division Street, Bellingham. I'd like to make an observation, and the observation would be that it's been my vast experience that the planning director and the planning staff are acutely aware of what issues that you discussed this evening would affect positively or adversely the immediate neighbors, the general neighborhood, or the city as a whole. Now having said that, most of what you talked about that does not adversely affect the immediate neighbors or the neighborhood or the city as a whole are minor changes to our regulations that if the developer wanted to make these minor changes and was forced by the regulations to choose between going to a public hearing at the hearing examiner and taking the time and money, it has been my experience that if it was a minor change, the developer might not go through the effort to make that improvement. And that's illogical. We should do what we can to allow the developer and the staff to jointly make changes. Two preliminary plats, filed plats, lot design, whatever. The variance and departure um, threshold of a hardship is virtually impossible to meet, and I bet if we asked Kathy, there haven't been many hardship variances granted. Uh, they're, they're more often for higher quality land planning or architecture. So if we trust the staff, which I think we should, to look after the community and the changes are minor, we should encourage a path, which is what we're talking about this evening, to not going, not go to a public hearing, which um, might give somebody an opportunity to not go through. As and Steve, you mentioned whether or not ninety percent is too restrictive. I think if we if we looked at that one item. And if we said, let's assume 80% was not, um, was a, a better, um, a better number than 90%, maybe when we got, when we got further away from no change after 90%, 
if we went down to 80 percent, maybe we should put a requirement of design review on it, which would give flexibility yet give some certainty to the folks on either side of the issue. And that's a thought that we should carry further. More flexibility, but it comes with some standards. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And that speaks to Lisa's comment, I think, a little bit as well. All right, anyone else would like to comment? Okay, seeing no one, we will end the comment component of this work session. And I think with that, the, the work session's done, although I would like to ask what your thoughts are for like next steps maybe in terms of, I know our next meeting, we'll talk about what our next meeting is, it's not a, a work session on this topic. So what are you thinking for coming no, back? No, it, and it is a work session. We're gonna come back with uh, chapters 1808, 1836, and 1806. And those will be, um, where we get into plat design lot standards and all of that, which- But, but not on the 20th. Oh, sorry, no. Okay, no, that's, I just wanted to clarify. The next meeting, I thought you meant the next, whenever the next is. Whenever the next meeting is, we'll tackle those remaining okay, chapters. Okay, sorry. Is that correct? Uh, yes, 1808, 1836, and 1806. And Kathy, you'll be providing us prior to the meeting with the two sections that we haven't seen yet on mylar and survey standards yes. and definitions. Yep. So we'll have a chance to review yep. them. Okay. Great. Okay. So um, with that, we will move into uh, old and new business. And we have business that's kind of old and new, I guess, because we have some appointments to subcommittees um, that are pre existing. But, uh, but we need to, to get some new members, right, Kurt? And so we've got uh, shoreline, appointments to the Shoreline Committee, which we postponed. Correct. Yep. Last time. And then after that, we'll do ADUs, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that first. Sure. But let's talk about Shoreline Committee, because right now um, it's Lisa, Steve, and myself, um, which technically is a full slate. Um, and so I think at the last meeting, Steve, you mentioned that you'd be willing to continue on in service. Uh, at the last meeting, I said no. But uh, I, since then, I have changed my mind 180 <laughs> degrees out, and I would be more than glad to continue through the calendar year on the uh, Shoreline Subcommittee. Great. Lisa? I'm willing to continue unless somebody is just so enamored with the thought of, you know, displacing okay. me. But I'll continue for the calendar year. Gotcha. Unless somebody else wants to. Well, I'm with Lisa. Unless, um, you know, someone else, Mike, Iris, you know, either of you or um, Phyllis, I know you have a conflict, or Garrett feels like you'd be interested in participating in the Shoreline Subcommittee, then I'd be willing to continue and that would take care of that issue. The, the subcommittee meets for Shoreline permits, it's what, Steve, like in, once in, every couple months, maybe? In three and a half years, we've had 10 sessions. So it's not a huge commitment. They occur the same day. We just had one today. It's before the meeting, usually 5.30. Um, so if, if, you know, if one of the two of you are interested, um, you could supplant Lisa or I. Uh, there's also an ADU f subcommittee that needs members. And so, you know, if you're interested in participating in that more, um, then, you know, I'd, we're okay with you reserving that. Um, so... I don't know. What do you guys think about shorelines? Um, can we do the ADU one and then come back? Yeah, sure. Why don't we do that? Because we've got what we need now, and if, then if, yeah. if there's further interest, we can come back to it. I Kurt? Want to ask myself too. Yeah, for sure. Kurt, do you want to talk a little bit about the ADU focus group? Sure. So if you, if you recall, or for other people that um, are new to it, um, as part of our subdivision uh, update process, as well as part of our ADU process, we created subcommittees of individual groups. And uh, we had the subcommittee for the, of the Planning Commission for the ADUs, and at that time, it was Phyllis and Jeff Brown. Jeff Brown is no longer one of our uh, commissioners, and so we need to fill that um, role again. Uh, just because the subcommittee has already done a lot of work on it and where we're at in the, in the overall process. Um, we will be reconvening the subcommittee probably late April, maybe May, somewhere either late April or, or May is when we'll be reconvening that subcommittee because we've been working on um, 
some direction that we have. We've been working on some code changes. We've been working with a couple neighborhoods as well um, regarding some test pilot or some piloting um, changes. So I can see the focus group maybe one, two more meetings before we get back to the full planning commission. So it'll probably be a light workload looking at how where we've come, um, kind of the the most recent changes, most mostly dealing with um, the the neighborhoods that we're working with now. So. And, and just to clarify what you said, that ultimately will come back to the full body. Correct, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'll be reconvening the, the subcommittee um, late April, early May, maybe one or two meetings, and then we'll bring everything back to the Planning Commission, the whole, the whole Planning Commission probably in the summer. So. And we just need- Do you have a normal meeting time, meeting day or time? Not at this point. Uh, because the committee is relatively small, we've, we, what we've done in the past is try to work um, with those individuals okay. to create a, a, a time and place that works for everyone. Gotcha. And you're looking for one person effectively. One person, yeah. one, okay. one more planning commissioner, yes. Anybody you'd like to participate? Uh, go for it. Great. Garrett? No? I'm just looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to having it back for with the, the group. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah, so it, great. It'd be good. We've done a lot of work on it. All right. Do we need to do anything formal to appoint uh, Iris, or can we just kind of like? No, her? not for the sub. I mean, not for a replacement. Okay. So, so. Yes. Yep. All right, you're it. Good job. <laughs> um, Lisa. I was able to sit in on the um, subdivision work group just to start getting my mind around some of the suggestions. Will that be available for anyone who might want to attend the ADU? Not necessarily as a participant, but as a observer in the corner. Sure, we've done that with our past ones. Um, as part of our overall update process, we've identified when the meetings are. So yeah, we can do that. Would it be are they appropriately to get noticed email? though? So if like more than, I mean, if there's two planning commissioners and say two more show up, is that a problem? No, well, you're not making decisions at that at that meeting. Um, Maybe you wouldn't be able to participate. I think, yeah. right? Yeah, it's not four commissioners talking. It's not four commissioners on the committee. It's two, and then the others are public representatives. And even as a commissioner, you're allowed to be a public citizen. So, Fair enough. So you just have to be sure not to participate, probably. Well, I guess you could, but if two people showed up, that'd be a problem. Okay, well, circling back to shorelines, are you interested? I'd be interested yeah. You'd be interested? Want to Rochambeau for it? <laughs> no, if you're, you know what, I actually enjoyed sitting in on that. I like, I like the shoreline stuff, and I just had taken a hiatus and thought it would be too much, but um, I'm okay sticking around if you want to. Yeah, I'll step down then okay. so you can participate. Great. All right, well, let's appoint uh, Mike. And Steve Sundin told us that there'd be more stuff coming, so you may see a meeting in the next month or so. Okay. Okay, great. So that's it for old and new business. And uh, our next meeting is the 20th. There's two rezones. Anything special you want to talk about, Kerr? Or those are pretty. We got the packet, which is great. Yeah. Appreciate getting that early. No, pretty straightforward. Um, we've got one relatively small one um, off of Mount Baker Highway, and then we've got one off of uh, Pacific Highway that's coming forward. Um, both relatively straightforward, not too controversial. Um, Great. And the, yeah, and those will be public hearings, right? Great. Her, yes. Public hearings. Yep. Public hearings. Great. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. That was great. And uh, welcome, Iris Mike. Thanks for yeah. participating right out of the gates. And with that, we will adjourn.